All right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I know you have a very intense schedule this afternoon. This is the fourth lecture. And I'm actually quite terrified to be the last, mo uh, the last one standing in between you and a pool party. <laughs> and, um, but I'm still happy to be here to talk about uh, this topic, even though it is often considered to be a dry one. Yeah, it's about measurement and economics, so we will talk about some methodological problems. Um, and it is often considered to be dry, but um, I'll do my best to make it uh, light and uh, lively. So uh, let's jump into the lecture. This is um, the plan. I will give a brief introduction to the topic, and then I will talk about um, the program of modern econometrics, which is yeah, one of the movements in economic science that has really pushed this idea that science is measurement. So this is related to the title of the of the talk. Um, and as I will try to show, one of the most important elements in uh, the program of modern econometrics was this attempt to measure and quantify value, welfare, or utility. So I will then, in the third part, go into some examples of the standard analysis in utility and welfare economics. Um, and then I will, of course, criticize them. And uh, at the end of the uh, lesson, um, I want to convince you that econometrics is not all bad. There are parts of econometrics that are still useful. Econometrics and econometric methods are particularly useful when we understand and use them as descriptive tools. And uh, the reference for this uh, talk is a recently published paper of mine in the uh, European History uh, Journal of the History of Economic Thought. Um, this is about uh, Pavel Ciompa and the meaning of econometrics. Very interesting read, so some elements you will find there in more detail. And this paper is actually a good example of a roundabout uh, production process because I wrote the first draft in 2016 <laughs> when I was a fellow here at the Mises Institute and now it got published, so it took some time. But I'm very happy that it is out. All right, so um, let's uh, jump into the content of this lecture. So. Um, there are basically uh, two main developments in uh, the economics of the 20th century. And this is not me speaking. This is the uh, general uh, perceived history of economic thought. There was a very influential development in theory, which is, of course, the uh, emergence of Keynesian economics, that what is sometimes called the Keynesian revolution, with John Maynard Keynes and the publication of his general theory in 1936. And then there is an important development in method methodology. And uh, this is uh, related to the emergence and the rise of modern econometrics. Around the same time, also in the 1930s, the Econometric Society was founded, one of the most influential economic societies in the world still today. And the most influential branch of economics in the post-World War II area was really at the intersection of these two developments. You had, for example, the large-scale Keynesian macroeconomic models in the post-war era to improve, plan the economy and rebuild the economies after the war. And um, in yeah, my assessment, the Keynesian uh, revolution was important, of course. But arguably, the methodological development was even more important and more lasting because it is not only tied to Keynesian economics, but it really has influenced all major branches of economics today. So, and this is what we want to talk about in this lecture, of course, the methodological changes that uh, happened uh, because of the rise of modern econometrics. These are the two uh, gentlemen who are closely connected to the rise and the emergence of modern econometrics. They are not the only ones. There were many economists, very famous economists, involved uh, in this movement. Uh, in America, for example, Irving Fisher, 
was a founding member of the Econometric Society. In Austria, we have Joseph Schumpeter, who was not really active in pushing the agenda himself. He did not change economic analysis uh, towards the ideal that econometrics uh, uh, postulated, but he encouraged, of course, his fellow economists. And among those, most importantly, were Ragnar Frisch from Norway on the left and Jan Tinbergen from the Netherlands on the right. And um, they are really the most important uh, economists uh, in this development, which is uh, shown by the fact that they were the first recipients of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics that was awarded in 1962. Ragnar Frisch was the one who came up with the uh, vision of what econometrics should be. And Jan Tinbergen was really one of the first who applied it in large-scale models in the inter- and post-war um, period. And so this is why they won uh, the Nobel jointly. According to Olaf Bierkold, who is um, the uh, most important Frisch expert these days, uh, Ragnar Frisch deserves a place in the history of economic thought, a lasting place in the history of economic thought, just because of the opening sentences of this 1926 paper that he originally published in French. This is the English introduction, where he first defines in the modern sense what econometrics is all about. And he says that intermediate between uh, mathematics, statistics, and economics, we find a new discipline, which, for a lack of a better name, may be called econometrics. And then he moves on to declare the essential, most important goal of econometrics, which is to turn economics into a science in the strict sense of the word. And uh, this means, of course, a science modeled after physics and astronomy. So he wanted to apply the natural scientific method or natural scientific methods to economics and thus transform, transform economic science. In his own uh, 20, 1926 paper, he argues that there are really two aspects um, to accomplishing this. There is what he called the theoretical quantitative aspect, and then there is the empirical quantitative aspect. So under the theoretical quantitative aspect, he understands the quantification, the mathematical reformulation of economic theory, and the formulation of economic theory in terms of at least potentially measurable magnitudes and variables. Yeah, we cannot really use things that are unmeasurable, unobservable, and that are not quantifiable. We have to boil economic theory down to something that is measurable, observable, and can be treated mathematically. So that's the theoretical quantitative element, reformulation of economic theory. And then the related aspect to it, that's the empirical quantitative element. This is when we try to test empirically the quantitative theoretical propositions that we've come up with. And um, yeah, a lot of the developments in modern economics are really either in one of the two or in both of these uh, yeah, camps, right? Uh, think about the ISLM formalization of Keynesian economics. That fits into the theoretical quantitative uh, aspect. Think about the large-scale Keynesian macro models. They are empirical quantitative attempts to test Keynesian theory. And um, this whole enterprise was really quite successful, according at least to Jan Tinbergen himself, who said that very interestingly, unlike uh, the attempts around 1838 by Cournot, a French economist, and 1870 by Valras, uh, Jevons, and Menger, which did not, not succeed, the third wave of quantification was successful. So this is really interesting, right? He, there were, of course, attempts before to quantify economics, to turn it into a science in the strict sense of the word, but that he lumps in Menger with Jevons and Valras, really surprising. Menger, of course, was not really involved in the business of formalizing economic theory mathematically, not at all. But uh, Jevons and Valras were, so, and they can be considered uh, to be precursors of the modern econometric project. 
And you see that in the works of Frisch, for example, who references both Valra and, uh, most importantly, Jevons. In his 26 paper, he refers to Jevons' dream as one of the main goals of econometrics. And the dream that Jevons uh, expressed in his main work uh, was the quantification, the assessment of marginal utility of goods, changes of marginal utility of goods. That was the goal. Yeah, that would be great if we could do that. And you know, after a career as the most successful Norwegian economist, Frisch, after receiving the Nobel Prize, said that, well, yeah, it's not a dream anymore. In 1970, he said, we accomplished Jevons dream. We are now capable of measuring marginal utility. You might wonder, how did that happen? Yeah, how did the dream become true? And yeah, if you look into the development of economics in the 20th century, we have, of course, a mathematization of economic theory. Right? We have a mathematical axiomatization of microeconomic theory, for example. And you learn about this um, under the terms of determination, additivity, transitivity of preferences, for example, in microeconomic theory. And if you study uh, economics at the university level, you learn about utility as a mapping of multidimensional uh, bundles of economic goods to a cardinal scale. And it is really a cardinal scale, even though in the first chapters it's always introduced as ordinal. But once we get to the important applications, it's always cardinal. Yeah? So don't be fooled by them introducing it as ordinal and then moving on to analyzing it in a cardinal uh, manner. Um, the question is, of course, how, we do, how do we define uh, or how do we find out about this mapping? And Frisch himself said, well, it's of course difficult, but in principle, we can ask questions, right? We can ask questions, we can interrogate um, human beings, and we can gain experience par interrogation, as he called it, he published in French. And uh, when people tell us what they prefer, we have at least, in the first instance, an ordinal ranking of what they like and what they like less. Um, how do we get to a cardinal measure? Well, um, Frisch ap uh, appealed to everyday experience. That's what he literally said. By an appeal to everyday experience, we can abstract from the ordinal ranking that we get from interview data and come to a cardinal measurement of utility. And once we have that, uh, we can, of course, move on and do scientific utility and welfare analysis. So um, if you look at all of this, you, you realize that the scientific basis seems to be very thin. Yeah? Um, it's not very convincing. But it is also clear that if this project were to succeed, uh, what we could do would actually be yeah, assessing and maximizing potentially uh, total welfare, social welfare, yeah? engage in economic planning. And the entire econometric project is really uh, tied up into a movement in economic policy towards planning. Right? That what is what made it uh, so interesting and appealing to policymakers because it, is, it was useful or it promised to be useful in economic planning. So um, we can move on to standard utility and welfare analysis, welfare economics. Um, let's first um, define what it is. Yeah. Uh, this, those definitions are drawn from Rothbard, but I think um, mainstream economists would, uh, would agree with them. Yeah? Utility theory analyzes the laws of value and choice of individuals. So utility theory is really the basis for all the economic theory we, drive, uh, we derive uh, from it, yeah? for the entire framework of economic theory, if you like. And um, welfare economics, is when we look at the interplay of individual value, individual choices and action, and try to draw scientific conclusions about the desirability of different alternatives. Yeah, we want to draw conclusions about 
whether one uh, economic intervention is preferable over another, whether one institutional setup is preferable o over another, and so on. Scientifically, yeah, that's the goal. And um, that means, for example, we want to assess the welfare implications, the changes in social utility that emanate from taxation, uh, from subsidies, from price controls, from monopoly, and from partial and potentially complete economic planning. How does it improve or not uh, on the uh, social welfare of society? And since we have to talk about measurable elements, it is no wonder that standard economics focuses not really on subjective value, but on something that is actually measurable, which is money and money prices, and um, in particular, the reservation prices uh, for goods. Here you have a random selection of uh, male uh, first names. And um, we think of, of these... Uh, men as potential uh, sellers of some economic good. Since you have heard a lecture about minimum wages just before, let's think about this as being the reservation prices for some um, uh, labor service. Yeah, so our uh, Joe here, the first one, has a reservation price of two, and Sean, the last one, has a reservation price of 10. This is a reflection of their opportunity costs. Yeah, so Joe is the most e efficient provider of whatever the service is, and Sean has very high opportunity costs. He has maybe something more important to do, that's why he would charge a higher price, um, or maybe he's just so unproductive in terms of the time he needs to do it, and so on. Yeah. And um, let's uh, add uh, another set of random female names this time, which represent the reservation prices of potential buyers of the product. We have uh, Marty, Felicia, Pat, Susie, and Christy, and their reservation prices from 12, uh, 10, 9, 8, and 6. So the reservation prices of the buyers are the maximum prices they are willing to pay for the service. The reservation prices of the sellers is the minimum price that they would accept uh, when selling the service. And of course, from this, uh, we can uh, derive um, the standard uh, supply and demand schedule, right? The supply schedule is just a uh, ordering of uh, those reservation prices from lowest to highest. Yeah? We add all of these reservation prices to our um, diagram and we have magically our supply schedule. And uh, we can add to this, of course, the demand schedule derived from the reservation prices of the potential buyers, and we do the same thing. We add them, this time in descending order, and we have our demand schedule. So now, um, from this, we obtain an equilibrium, yeah? a market equilibrium, this is where demand and supply intersect. This is the price at which the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied is the same. Here in our situation, um, we have an equilibrium price of $8 and a quantity of four. And once we have this, we can assess um, the social utility um, of the situation, the social utility that is generated or the mutual benefit that is generated through these interactions. And um, this is based, firstly, on the concept of consumer surplus. Consumer surplus is the difference between the reservation prices of the buyers and the actual prices they uh, have to pay for the product. So we go along our uh, demand schedule and look at the difference between the prices that they are willing to pay and the prices they have to pay, and we can quantitatively assess the consumer surplus. Right? We have a consumer surplus for Mario of $4, uh, then of $2, of $1, and so on. And our marginal buyer has no consumer surplus, right? Reservation price is equal to the price paid. So, um, and of course, the buyer that is not actually buying has no consumer surplus either. And um, so we end up with the quantitative assessment of the benefit, this, the benefit that is generated for the consumers in this situation. And conceptually, we can ex do exactly the same. Um, for the uh, suppliers, right? We look at the difference between the reservation prices and the prices they actually receive, and we can assess 
the producer surplus in this situation, and we can quantify it. Yeah, we can give a quantitative uh, measure to the consumer and the producer surplus. And producer surplus would be 12 in this situation, consumer surplus seven, and we end up with um, an assessment of total utilities, total welfare, which is the sum of consumer and producer surplus. This, at this time, it is, uh, or in this situation, it's $19. So now we can move on, right? Assess the welfare implications of, for example, a minimum wage or a price floor. Yeah, let's assume that there is a price floor of $11. So the people are not allowed to trade at $8. They have to trade at 11 or more. In this situation, of course, um, the quantity that can be exchanged is much smaller. Right? The quantity is only one unit. There's only one mutually beneficial trade because we have only one buyer who's willing to pay more than 11. And uh, the equilibrium price will be 11, potentially more, depends on the bargaining situation, but we keep it simple. And um, we get a welfare loss. Now we have a measure of the welfare loss. We look at the consumer and producer surplus that is lost because of that uh, intervention. And we can quantify it once again. Uh, consumer surplus in this situation is only one. Producer surplus is only nine. Total surplus is 10. And we have a welfare loss of $9. So we can, give an, we can attach a number to that welfare loss. That's the standard um, analysis of dead weight loss from a situation where you have a price flow above the equilibrium price. So of course this assumes that these individuals that are represented here are still at this position on the demand and supply schedule. Right? We have now random pictures of a Joe and a Sean that are represented here on the supply schedule. This assessment or an analysis of the deadweight loss of the welfare loss assumes that Joe is still the one making the trade selling to Marty. Joe makes a, a producer surplus of nine in the situation. Um, but of course, Sean would be willing to sell as well at a price of 11. He has a reservation price of 10. And now think about a possible situation where Marty actually doesn't like Joe and prefers to buy from Sean because he's so much nicer and funnier. Yeah? <laughs> and then this might happen. Yeah. Sean makes the trade, and Joe is out of the market. And this changes the analysis. We have now a much smaller producer surplus, the difference between the reservation price and the received price. For Sean, it's only $1. Yeah, and so we have an additional welfare loss that comes into play here. And the deadweight loss is really bigger than the standard analysis would suggest. And it's just by one little you know, uh, reflection of, on the situation that you can find out that this is actually the case. And you can find out that the standard analysis only gives you the best case scenario, yeah, even, uh, if we accept the premises. Right? And this is an argument uh, that has been made by a uh, philosopher, David Schmitz, um, in a publication. And it's very interesting that you need a philosopher to point this out. It's a very simple, it's a very simple analysis, um, and it's true. Yeah? So the standard uh, analysis of deadweight loss from price controls uh, ignores that price controls lead to a situation where not the most efficient sellers sell and not the, the, the most willing or eager buyers buy. Because it's now possible for sellers or buyers, depending on whether you have a price floor or a ceiling, to discriminate based on other aspects than just the willingness to pay yeah, or the readiness to provide. Um, so that's one example. Uh, of how the standard analysis uh, is wrong. Um, and I want to give you another one, um, which is uh, the analysis of the welfare loss uh, from an excise tax, from taxation. So a, a tax, right, we have here a generic demand and supply schedule and an equilibrium situation. A tax can be interpreted as an additional cost that shifts the supply schedule, right? A tax has to be paid. It's like an additional cost. So it will shift um, the supply schedule upwards. And in the situation where the demand schedule 
is relatively price elastic, well, that means it's relatively flat, um, you have a reduction in the uh, a big reduction in the quantity exchange, and hence a big uh, dead weight loss, a big welfare loss, um, shown here as the red triangle between the demand and the supply schedule. Yeah, so a price elastic demand leads to a big welfare loss when you have an ex excess tax on the product, and um, yeah, when you have the opposite case of a price inelastic demand, and you think about yeah, the same sort of tax added, uh, same cost added on the supply schedule, uh, you have now a small deadweight loss because the quantity that is um, exchanged is reduced only very little. This is, of course, because the producers are now able to um, transfer the burden of the tax onto the consumers because they are willing to buy the product anyway, even if it's more expensive. That's what it means to have an inelastic demand. You buy it anyway. And um, this um, leads to the standard conclusion in optimal tax theory. Right? The standard uh, conclusion is that you should tax markets where the demand is inelastic, and the same goes for supply. Right, we could expand on this, but this is not really important now. But the standard conclusion is you have a small welfare loss when you tax markets with a price inelastic demand, because the quantity exchanged and the mutual benefit that is generated um, remains relatively high after the tax is imposed. This um, yeah, ignores an important aspect, and this has been pointed out by a publication of Tate Fegley, Christopher Hansen, and myself. It is, for the moment, only published as a working paper. But you can realize the problem when you look at the overall expenditure um, on the product, right? We have, after the taxation, a sharp increase in the price for the buyers, and only a small decrease in the quantity. This leads to a situation where the overall expenditure or overall spending on the product is actually increased after the tax is imposed. And now you don't have to be a genius to figure out that this obviously has implications on other areas in the economy. When you have to spend more on some product, you have less money for some other products. So if you just open to focus a little bit and think about potential other markets, you realize that, well, there must be a reduction in spending. That is a shift in demand for other products. There is lower demand for other products now and a reduction in the quantities exchanged. So there is, of course, an additional welfare loss in other markets that emerges uh, from that taxation. And if you look only at the tax market, you do not take that into account. So you underestimate um, the welfare loss from taxation. That's uh, another example of, uh, of a criticism of the standard theory that accepts the premises. So both Schmitz and Fegley et al. are criticisms that are internal, right? We see, okay, we look at the premises of the analysis and then we show that the conclusion drawn is actually wrong or not quite complete or misleading, yeah? So they are internal criticisms, but um, they point at something very important, at a very important problem, and that is the fallacious assumption of constancy, the ceteris paribus assumption. Right? What is assumed in this analysis is that everything else remains constant. Right? We t impose a tax on some product and everything else remains unchanged. That's, of course, not true. Yeah? And uh, so the uh, analysis of, or the assumption of constancy is really problematic. Um, but of course, there are, there are more fundamental uh, criticisms of, of this analysis, and you can find those, for example, in Rothbard's famous 1956 paper, uh, Toward the Reconstruction of Utility and Welfare Economics. Um, that's a paper where Rothbard argues that scientifically, there are really only two principles with which we can work in order to draw conclusions about the desirability of alternative situations. Those two principles are the unanimity rule, or the Pareto principle, and um, the principle of demonstrated preferences. So the Pareto principle uh, just states that we can talk about an improvement 
in a social welfare or total utility, whatever you want to call it, only in a situation where at least one person is made better off and nobody is harmed. That's an improvement in total uh, welfare. And uh, the principle of demonstrated preferences states that we can know about whether or not somebody's situation has improved only to the extent that the, de that the preferences have de been demonstrated in action in a given situation at a given point in time under given circumstances. That's the only way we can do that. And what is required for that? Well, we have to know that the interaction or the transaction, the exchange was voluntary. There was no rights violation involved. It was an interaction of the free market. And then Rothbard, of course, draws these very strong and provocative conclusions that have aroused a lot of criticism. Uh, he states that uh, the free market uh, always increases social utility. Yeah, so that is, of course, in the exante sense of the word. Of course, people make mistakes in some situations. Yeah? But in the exante sense of the word, a voluntary transaction is, in that sense, based on these principles, welfare enhancing. It increases social utility. And a government intervention cannot increase social utility because it is essential to a government intervention that somebody is harmed, somebody has to pay for it. Uh, somebody is prohibited from engaging in a transaction that he would like to engage in, or he has to make a transaction that he doesn't want to make. Yeah? So you can, of course, imagine situations where a government action is uh, not a violation or not against uh, the preferences of anyone, but that's very artificial. The essence of government intervention is, of course, coercion. Uh, the government is the institution of organized coercion in society, and that is what is essential to government intervention. And in that sense, you can never show scientifically that social utility, social welfare, total welfare is enhanced after a government intervention. Yeah, and that uh, the fundamental problem is, of course, that yeah, we cannot really measure utility quantitatively. There is no objective measure of utility. There is no cardinal measure of utility. Even these money prices, this Reservation prices, if we could uh, measure those, they are not really a measure of utility because money itself is a good that is valued differently and subjectively. So it's not an objective measure of utility. And um, yeah, Rothbard argued then very, uh, very uh, convincingly, in my opinion, that there is no such thing as total utility that can be maximized. Yeah, we don't have the target variable of our operations. It doesn't exist. Yeah. It cannot be measured. It cannot be maximized. And then he points out that all utilities are really marginal utilities. That's the only thing that we can assess in a way scientifically. We can only assess on the margin, given a certain transaction, whether it is welfare enhancing or not. And it is welfare enhancing to the extent that this is voluntary and not a rights violation. Um, even if you uh, could, yeah, at least indirectly measure uh, utility from demonstrated preferences in a certain situation, the next problem is that you cannot then use these measurements in another situation, extrapolate from those observed uh, situations, because things change. Things don't remain constant. And um, that is the fundamental problem for the application of utility and welfare economics in the real world. You cannot hold things constant, even if you can in certain situations maybe get a good estimation of what the value assessment is of uh, actors. You cannot use that in other situations and then apply it. Um, and so this uh, jeopardizes the application of standard utility and welfare economics in the real world, but it also undermines completely one essential part of the econometric project, which I come to now. Um, so for this, it is important to understand one distinction. And that's the distinction between uh, description and induction in statistic analysis. Um, description or descriptive statistics is just an attempt to measure what we can measure and um, describe or account for the evolution of measurable variables. That's something that can be more or less useful um, 
but it's certainly not problematic from a methodological point of view uh, to do that. What is problematic is statistical induction in the social sciences at least. And statistical induction is drawing generalized conclusions from observed data. That's the attempt to falsify or verify even on the basis of empirical data certain theoretical propositions. The main um, yeah, idea of in inductive econometrics is uh, the following. Yeah? Uh, it always operates on the basis of measurable observable variables and you then postulate a set of variables that are the causes and a set of measurable variables that are the effect. And uh, you postulate some model, some quantitative mathematical relationship, some functional relationship between them. Yeah, so you have x1 and x2 as the measurable causes and you have y as the measurable effect. So the idea of inductive statistic, uh, st econometrics, is now um, that you put your model to the test. Yeah, you are willing to revise your model, to falsify your model in light of new evidence. So for example, uh, you might observe that all of the sudden, the same configuration of causal factors leads to a different effect. Instead of Y, you observe Z. So now you draw the, conclusions, uh, the conclusion from that there must have been some other factor that was important as well that I did not include in my initial model. Maybe there was some factor X3 that I forgot. So you add it to your model. And uh, when you are really a sophisticated statistician, then you might even think, how oh, maybe the whole thing is not uh, linear. Yeah? It's a nonlinear uh, relationship. And you, uh, you revise, you refine your model so that it fits the data again. And now you have a new tentative explanation for your phenomena that you are still willing to reject in light of new empirical evidence. Uh, you are still willing to falsify and refine and revise your model further. Um, that's the project of inductive econometrics. And the hope is that you approach in this process the truth, that you come closer and closer to the true model. Now, the problem, of course, in this uh, whole enterprise is that the process of hypoth hypothesis testing, yeah, of formulating and refining new hypotheses and then testing those again, presupposes that there is some constant relationship between causes and effects. So it assumes that there is a correct model that is correct and correct and constant over time. Because if there was no such model, you would be chasing a moving target and you might actually be correct in one point in time with your model. It might be wrong the next day. It might be correct again in the future. Okay, so you do not really falsify anything and you do not ver verify anything either. Yeah? So you need a constant uh, functional relationship between the variables that you think of as causes and the variables that you think of as effects. And of course, Mises very famously said that there are no constants in economics. Yeah? Um, and that's probably true. A very good justification for this claim was given by Hans Hermann Hoppe, whom I was very happy to find out was the mystery speaker of the first evening. So he addressed you on some of these elements already. Um, in my assessment, the most important uh, publication uh, in relationship to this problem in economics is his 1983 German uh, language book, Kritik, Kritik der Kausalwissenschaftlichen Sozialforschung. Elements of this book uh, have been translated and published in English, but the German is really so much more sophisticated. <laughs> So you should all learn German and read it. It's, 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 in, my, in my opinion, it's really one of the most important contributions of Hans Hermann Hoppe, which is often overlooked uh, in light of his other altogether more provocative contributions. Yeah? But, but, it's, but it's really, really good. And he uh, shows in this uh, book that the constancy principle that you have to assume for this uh, 
scientific project to work does not hold in economics or in the social sciences in general. And the constancy principle simply assumes or states that equal causes lead to equal effects. And if you observe unequal effects or different effects, that implies that there has been some configuration of different uh, causes, unequal causes. And only under this assumption, this whole uh, project of falsifying and refining and reformulating your hypotheses makes sense. Um, why does it not hold? Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the important question. And the answer that uh, Hobbe gives is very uh, intriguing. It's very simple, but yeah, all the more elegant because of its simplicity. Between these measurable variables that we think of as causes and the measurable variables that we think of as effects, there is in economics and the social sciences in general a human actor. And human actors can learn. That's very important. And yeah? they have an ability to learn. And uh, Hoppe drew here in, this, uh, in his argument on an argument interestingly made by Karl Popper against the Marxist theory of history. Popper said that there cannot be a scientific theory of how history will turn out in the future. That's impossible because human beings are capable of learning. So we cannot scientifically predict the course of history. And Hoppe said, thank you, Karl. This is great, but it also means that falsification doesn't work in the social sciences and in economics in particular. Yeah. Um, if human beings are capable of learning and the effects that come out are dependent on our state of knowledge and our state of learning, then we cannot scientifically predict what will come out. We cannot scientifically predict the why, and there is no constant relationship between the x's on the left-hand side and the y's on the right-hand side, because people find out about new things, and this is learning in a very broad sense of the word. We find out about the circumstances, we change maybe our evaluation of things, um, and we change our behavior even if the quantitatively measurable configuration of causal factors is the same. So there's no constant uh, relationship. Let me uh, draw this uh, yeah, main conclusion then. The inductive part of modern econometrics is problematic. Yeah, it is not justified because the constancy principle doesn't hold. And the descriptive part, on the other hand, is not. If we just try to describe what is the quantitatively measurable relationship between certain variables in the economy, this as such is more or less interesting. It can be more or less useful to guide us in our uh, pursuits of, of truth and knowledge. But it is not, in a way, methodologically uh, problematic. And this has been pointed out by the economist, the Polish economist, Paweł Ciompa, who is really the first who defined econometrics 16 years before Ragnar Frischstedt in 1910. And Ciompa said that, well, uh, econometrics, or as he also called it, economographics, should just be understood as, so, as some kind of descriptive economics. We try to describe what we can see in the real world. Um, and then econometrics just becomes the theory of accounting. How do we account for the evolution, the development of the economy, or of certain elements or aspects, parts of the economy? Yeah, and um, understood in this sense of the word, econometrics is entirely compatible with Austrian economics. Yeah, from the vantage point of Austrian economics, descriptive econometrics in this sense is not uh, problematic and um, yeah, can be used. Um, so empirical quantitative methods, statistical methods understood as tools to describe uh, the situation of the economy are useful in history, um, as Mises would also acknowledge. Um, and with that, I want to close the lecture and I thank you very much for your attention.